What's up guys? Jeff, moresaucemorehoss.com. Today we're going to be reacting to the hypertrophy technical rating tier list and I'm going to be reacting to the reaction of myself reacting and you can react at home to me reacting to myself reacting to myself. <clears throat> now you might be thinking, what the hell did I just click on? Well, I'm about to tell you before you click away, hopefully. Now, every exercise that you can do in the gym requires a different amount of skill and requires a different amount of time to master and then also to keep that level of mastery. So something like a preacher curl requires very, very little skill. Okay, you're starting in the bottom position, you curl up, boom, end of story, very little coordination required or stability or precision or anything like that. Compare that to a push press where you are dipping down, you are launching the bar upwards, you have to continue and press out with your arms, a lot of stability, coordination, core involvement, a lot of motor units activated, etc. So every exercise that you can do in the gym or outside of the gym can be put on this tier list. There's going to be five factors that determine where it is on this list that I just made up. The first is precision. If something requires you to be more precise, it is a higher level of mastery. So again, a preacher curl, there's really no way to get out of the groove. A bench press, there definitely is. Something like a snatch from the ground, you are launching the bar overhead and you have to catch it. If you are off by even a few centimeters, you are fucked. Mobility requirements, same thing. If you're pressing in front, doesn't require as much mobility. If you're pressing behind the neck, it requires significantly more. Number three, motor units activated or muscle mass used overall. Generally speaking, higher skill requirement exercises are going to be using more muscle mass. And machines or isolation movements are generally easier to master because, number four, they require less full body coordination. If you're using your lower body and your upper body together in one motion, uh, like a deadlift, like a push press, like a power snatch or whatever, those are just more difficult to learn and have a longer learning curve. Number five, stabilization and core activation. Again, if you're connecting that lower and upper body, that requires just more skill in general. So sprinting or gymnastics, that kind of thing, it is more challenging and it does take a longer time to learn and even more time to master. So why does this matter? You might be thinking, Jeff, just tell me what exercises to do, goddammit. I don't want to think so much. No, okay? It's important to be able to think in concepts because this gives you a much deeper understanding of why programming works or why some other programming doesn't work. You need to be able to think on a conceptual level rather than just thinking this exercise is good, this exercise is bad. It's not that simple. So let's start with tier one. Preacher curls are the first exercise, the first example. I'm not gonna go through every exercise you can do in the gym because there are many. There are hundreds, if not thousands, you can do. My book alone, Product Blog, has hundreds, and you can get that for $15 on my website. It is a hell of a deal. Oh my God, plugging products. So these exercises are simple. They are basic. Any beginner can go into the gym and do these. They are unfuck upable. It is really, really difficult to mess these exercises up. Hamstring curls. So you're, you're lying on this bench. You're just moving back and forth, point A to point B. You're locked in place, very little core activation, and it's hard to mess this up. Same thing with a leg extension. Again, you're, you're locked in place. You're really just extending your knee. It's just pure quads, no stability, no core, no lower back. No hamstring, no glutes, nothing. It's pure isolation and very, very beginner friendly. Same thing with machine rows. It's not like you can really, you know, round your back or hurt yourself on a machine row. You are not 18 anymore. If you did everything on that list, you would die. That wasn't challenge. challenge. Accepted. If so, if you hurt yourself on a machine row, I'm impressed. Next up, we have. Machine lateral raises, again, you're not in space, you can't really move as with dumbbells, and you're sort of just locked in place. See a trend here? Same thing with machine chest press. You can maybe, you know, alter the, you know, your shoulder position, etc., cetera, um, or scoot forward on the bench so it's more of a decline or more of an incline or whatever, but, you know, for the most part, you're locked in place, and it is very, very beginner-friendly. 
Tier 1 is mostly machine exercises. Keep in mind, I'm not saying these exercises are bad, and I'm not saying they're any worse for hypertrophy. It just means that they require less skill. So you can go into a machine press having never done it in the past four, five, six months and set a new personal best because there is very little skill or coordination or neuromuscular coordination required to actually get the job done. It is more of just, are you developed muscularly? Getting into tier two, we have back extension. So these are not an isolation movement. You're using the hamstrings, the glutes, the spinal erectors, even a little bit of calves to uh, press against the bottom part of the machine. This is still locking your hips in place. So you're still in a fairly fixed position. It's not like a squat where you can do whatever you want, but it is using more muscle mass than anything on tier one. Next up, we have leg press again. You're sort of fixed in position. You can move your feet up or down or, or side to side, whatever. But it is using more muscle mass and there is a little bit more timing and precision involved than anything on tier one. Hip thrust, same thing. Your feet are on the ground, your back is on the bench or on the ground in the case of a glute bridge. And there's really just one way to go. You're just thrusting up. It's not like you can thrust somewhere else. You're just thrusting in one way because your feet are on the ground and your back is on the bench or whatever. There's really not a lot of ways to mess it up. Biceps curl. So if you're standing and you're doing a curl, this is going to require more coordination, precision, etc. skill than something like a preacher curl or a spider curl where your torso is completely fixed in position. The standing barbell curl and even just a standing dumbbell curl, a hammer curl, it does require quite a bit of core activation. You'd be surprised how much lumbar EMG activity is going on when you do a curl. I'm not saying it's a great lower back builder, but it's certainly active. Same thing with the core. Because you have this giant weight out in front, it requires quite a bit of transverse abdominus activation so you don't snap your shit up. Also, your scapula is very involved. You're gonna wanna go like this in order to keep your shoulders down and your chest up this is quite, you know, this is a bit of lats, it's a bit of lower traps, rhomboids, etc. So there's a lot more going on in a curl than just biceps activation. A pull down. So a pull down is not really a machine. You can do whatever you want in a pull down. Okay, so you can lean way, way back. Uh, you can stay very, very upright. You can pull to the knees if you really wanted to. You could pull right to the dick, you could pull to the belly, you could pull, you know, pull to the sternum, the chest, the throat, the chin, take it on the nose, you could pull above if you really, really wanted to. I don't advise it, but it's possible. Even as he changed jerseys, he stayed true to his game. He stayed true to himself. He saw possibilities. So a pull down is not really a machine exercise. Um, it is, I guess it's a machine technically speaking, but because you have such freedom of movement, it does require a little bit more practice and skill. A Yates row. So there is quite a bit of core activation, but not as much as a normal barbell row because you're not super bent over. You're, you know, you're bent hinged forward, maybe where your torso is like 30 degrees or maybe 45 degrees at the most. And, you know, it's, more isolation, not fully isolation, but it's more isolation than a normal barbell row. And so it requires a little bit less skill. A normal lateral raise. So compared to a machine, you can basically move however you want in space. Therefore, it does require a little bit more practice. However, it's still an isolation movement and it's not like you're going to be using a ton of musculature because the, the side delt and the rear delts and, and all of these they're relatively small compared to other muscles, especially for you. Close grip bench press, also incline press, decline bench, <laughs> also dumbbell bench press, dips. You could make the argument for these being slightly higher, maybe in tier three, um, but I found that these are generally done for slightly higher reps compared to a competition style bench press. They require less practice in setting up, they require less of an arch, and therefore they are just less demanding in terms of skill and practice. You could not dumbbell bench press for a very long time, come into the gym and hit a personal best if everything else went up. Is that gonna happen on a barbell bench press? Probably not.
Next up, we have pull-ups. Now, you could also make the argument for these being in Tier 3, but honestly, they don't require a ton of skill. They really don't. If you can't do pull-ups, it's not because you lack skill at doing pull-ups. It's because you are either too weak or too fat or a combination. Those are really the only the only reasons, okay? If you see someone, they're like, yeah, I can't do any pull-ups. My first thought as a coach is not like, well, you better like practice the skill of doing pull-ups. No, it, it's usually just a, a strength to body weight issue. So tier two are the more complicated machines. A lot of isolation movements go in this category, as well as some compound movements that are relatively easy to learn and beginner friendly. So that is tier one and tier two combined. You can build a very, very impressive physique without ever going above this. If you look at a lot of professional bodybuilders training, yes, they're on the juice. But Juicy Juice is 100% all natural juice. Nestle Juicy Juice, the very best juice for the very best kids. But they're not doing tier five, tier four, and tier three in a lot of cases. You see some professional bodybuilders, they don't squat. They don't do flat barbell bench press. They don't, they don't deadlift. They don't do push press. They don't do all these more complicated movements. They basically stick to what is more isolation and then what is easier to stabilize. And they, you know, they do leg press, they do pack squats, they do, well, maybe not hip thrusts as much. Uh, they do Yates rows, lateral raises, a lot of machine work, etc. So you can develop a very, very good physique or even a great physique doing nothing but tier one and tier two. So I'm not saying these exercises are worse. I'm just saying they are easier to learn. All right, getting into tier number three, we have high bar back squats. So squatting is complicated. It is the most technical of the three power lifts. It requires quite a bit of stabilization, precision, a good amount of mobility, more than the average person often has. Trust me, I'm a coach. I see it all the time, people who cannot do a full squat. So if you're like an Olympic weightlifter and you're like, of course everyone can squat perfectly, look around. Coordination, stabilization, exact everything, you know, it is a complicated movement. And a lot of beginners, you know, maybe they should stick to goblet squats or leg press or something that is easier to learn, at least in the short term. I know that's sacrilege to a lot of people, but it's true. Next up, we have the deadlift. Now, this is probably a little bit technical than a typical squat. In a squat, you have that eccentric, you have that bounce or reversal, and then you stand up. So it has eccentric, reversal, and concentric, which a deadlift doesn't really have. An RDL does, um, but a typical deadlift, whether it's trap bar, whether it's conventional, whether it's sumo, whether it's a rack pull, does not really have that dichotomy. I would say sumo is a little bit more technical compared to conventional. If you get out of position on sumo, it's a lot less forgiving. Trap bar is also a little bit easier to learn in terms of mobility requirements compared to conventional. Um, but I'm just gonna put all deadlifts in this category. You could make the argument for some being slightly higher, perhaps being slightly lower depending on the variation. Um, but I would say tier three is a pretty good approximation. You also have box squats. You can make the argument for these being tier two as well, just because you have a target and so it's a little bit less of a free weight movement still free weight but less free i guess you could say um there's a little bit of variation there's only five tiers so sometimes there's a little bit of, of gray zone you also have the bent over row where you are more bent over compared to a yates row much more taxing on the spinal erectors on the core on the posterior chain just using more muscle mass in general and easier to mess up you also have the bench. Now this requires a little bit more practice in terms of the setup, especially, especially if you want to maximize performance on the bench press. If you're just bench pressing for hypertrophy, it's a little bit less practice. You don't have to have that huge arch. You don't have to really tuck and retract and depress the scapula, etc. cetera. Uh, and so I would say it's a little bit easier to learn, but generally speaking, bench press is gonna be done for lower reps compared to your bench press accessories. So most people aren't gonna max out on incline bench press or decline bench press or dips or something like that, if you're smart at least, okay? But for bench press, you see people max out much more often and lower reps tend to be more technical. And that goes for everything on this list. The lower the reps, the more technical requirements. And if you're doing say eight to 10 reps or 10 to 12 or even higher, that is less technically demanding. We also have overhead press in this category. You could also make an argument for these being tier four, just because you have a lot of core requirements, 
um, the serratus, the abdominals, the glutes, the quads, you're standing there in the air and there's a lot that can happen and it does require, I would say, more precision compared to a bench press. Just because you're out there, you're standing, the bar can go forward, it can go backward, your torso can move, balance is more of an issue, coordination, etc. And that is tier three. It's mostly compound movements and they're a little bit more challenging compared to tier two. How do I know this? Well, as a coach, I can just see it. Not very many people mess up a lateral raise or a pull down or a hip thrust, whereas squats, deadlifts, bent over rows, they are they require more coaching, more cueing, uh, more visualizations, etc., and really just more time and effort and energy in general to learn. That doesn't mean they're a waste of time, but you do have to realize that it will take more time. Tier four, we have front squats. Now these do require more mobility, especially if you're getting in that Olympic weightlifter position. If you're using straps or if you're using a cross grip or if you're using zombie grip, that might be a little bit easier in terms of the mobility requirements. Um, but I would say generally speaking, especially in the modern age, these do require practice and practice fairly frequently. If you don't front squat for a month, don't expect any personal bests. Next up, we have low bar back squats. If you tell an average beginner to unrack the bar in a back squat position, and they've never back squatted before, the vast majority of them will choose high bar. I'm talking like 95% or more people will put the bar high on the traps. Not very many people will put it low on the rear delts. It's mostly a hack to lift more weight as a power lifter. Now, some people do find the low bar position more comfortable and more natural. And so if that's the case, this might actually be reversed. Perhaps this is tier three and high bar is tier four for you. There's gonna be some individual variation. But for most people, I would say low bar is a little bit more technical. Next up, we have the good morning. Now these are fairly technical. I don't even program them very often uh, just because I think Romanian deadlifts and back extensions are better options for most people. They are extremely taxing on the core and on the spinal erectors. So when you're doing a Romanian deadlift, you can use the lats, the rear delts, you know, the traps, etc., to keep that bar close. With a good morning, this is not possible because the bar is fixed on your traps or on your rear delts if you use a low bar position. This means that the moment arm for your spine, for your spinal erectors, is quite a bit higher than with a Romanian deadlift. This means you can't lift as much weight, but it also means that it does require quite an ability to brace. And this is something that a lot of people don't quite have, especially if they're a beginner. Anderson squats. So if you start a normal squat, you go down, maybe you pause if it's a pause squat, then you go back up. In Anderson squat, you're starting from that bottom position. Therefore, you cannot really feel the weight before you actually squat it. And this means it does require a little bit more skill and practice. Bulgarian split squats. Now you can hold it in the front rack. I usually just hold it with, with two dumbbells. And you could make the argument for these being a little bit lower, I would say, but it does require quite a bit of stability and balance compared to a normal back squat. However, it also requires less mobility, and so it depends on what you are deficient in. Again, this is just a template with some examples. I could be wrong, especially I could be wrong for you. Perhaps you find that these are actually a very easy and natural movement. I have some clients who learn Bulgarian split squats in like a week. It's amazing seeing how fast they progress. For other people, it takes a long time. So again, this individual variation is important to realize. Push press. So I mentioned this one before, a lot more precision and timing. It happens a lot faster than an overhead press. You can overhead press really slowly if you wanted to, and you can almost correct in real time. So it gets out a little in front, you feel it, and you can adjust a little bit during the set or during the rep itself. With a push press, not so much. It's an explosive movement. It happens quickly. It's fusing the lower body through the core, to the upper body and push pressing that bar overhead. Therefore, it is just a more demanding and challenging and skill-based movement. We also have the behind the neck press or the cloak off press. This is in this category, in this tier, because it requires a lot more mobility. If you're at a desk all day like I am, 
you might find it hard to press behind the neck. In fact, it might not be a good option for you if you don't have that shoulder mobility. That doesn't mean it's a bad exercise. It means it's going to require some preparation before you can do it safely and effectively. It just means it's a bigger time investment for most people. I would rate tier four as tough compound movements. Generally speaking, they are close to full body, if not completely full body. They might have some special mobility requirements or precision. They might be explosive, etc. But all of these are a step up in terms of time commitment compared to tier three, and especially compared to tier two and one. All right, tier five. Now you can get jacked doing these movements. They can be effective for hypertrophy. However, I would never ever recommend it because it's a very suboptimal way of going about things. So you have Olympic weightlifting, the snatch and the clean and jerk. These are completely full body. Think about what is happening in a snatch or a clean and jerk. Okay, you are flinging a potentially very heavy barbell over your head. Okay, so you're basically explosively deadlifting it from the floor, flinging it to your shoulders or overhead, catching it and standing up. That is extremely challenging, and there's a reason why most Olympic weightlifters practice a lot. They do variations or the lifts themselves every single day, if not multiple times per day. Just because that level of precision and timing and skill requires a ton of upkeep. And if you went to the average Olympic weightlifter or even a very, very accomplished Olympic weightlifter and you were like, hey, bro, I want to get big. Should I do nothing but Olympic weightlifting? They'd be like, no, what? no, that's extremely suboptimal. OK, because, again, it's more of a skill than just building muscle sprinting. You can build muscle sprinting, especially hill sprinting. I'll have a full video on that. But especially sprinting on the track at a high level is extremely taxing and extremely skill based. Everything is happening, assuming you're any good, extremely quickly. Therefore, your technique has to be on point and everything has to be very, very dialed in. This requires a lot of frequent practice. Not every sprinter is going to be doing all out sprints multiple times per week. Usually they do all that efforts like twice, maybe three times per week, but they're going to be doing drills. They're going to be practicing. They're going to be doing mobility work, especially for the hip flexors. They're going to be doing supplementary strength work for their weak points. And sprinting at a high level is an extremely big time commitment. It really is. And so again, if you went to the average spinner, you're like, hey, bro, I want to get big muscles. Would they be like, yeah, yeah, just sprint? No. Same thing for gymnastics. Now, maybe I'll do a whole video on calisthenics. It's not really my thing, but you can get jacked doing calisthenics or doing gymnastics. Is it optimal? Fuck no. And again, if you went to a high level gymnast and you're like, hey man, I just want to gain muscle. Should I do what you're doing? No, they'd say, okay, go, go do bodybuilder style of training. That's bodybuilder style of training for a reason, because it's going to be optimal for building muscle. I'm not saying you can't build muscle with this kind of training. You absolutely can. It's just not going to be the best way of going about things. It's harder to progress. Often there are gaps in the progressions. So, you know, you go from like a partial range of motion to a full range of motion, and it's like way, way more difficult. Whereas with weightlifting uh, or bodybuilding training, you can always just add 2.5 kilos, then 5 kilos, then 7.5, then 10 kilos. And it's a very easy and measurable way to progress. Whereas calisthenics or gymnastics, not so much. Plus, precision, mobility, muscle mass use, stabilizers, coordination, all of those it requires in spades. So again, not the best choice for pure muscle growth. Not hating on it, just saying what every high level gymnast would agree on, not going to be optimal for hypertrophy. Again, MMA, uh, you know, karate, judo, jujitsu, whatever, all of these are very, very technical. Plus, you're facing a live opponent. So you have to prepare a ton for what a living person with an actual brain could do. Whereas with a bench press or a lateral raise, it's not like the bench, you know, is going to punch you in the middle of a set. Okay, so you don't really have to prepare for a wide variety of situations and you can just focus on working the muscle. Can you gain muscle doing MMA training? Sure, I guess, but it's not going to be efficient 
and certainly not optimal. I would say these are elite compounds or simply just other activities which don't really promote hypertrophy in an optimal way. The most technical of all, chess. Chess press, pawn to E9. So why is all of this important? It's not important. I just wasted a shitload of your time. All right, fine, fine, fine. Realize that the higher the tier, the longer it's gonna to take to master, for most people, almost everyone in, in tier five, and the more you have to practice it to upkeep that skill. We talking about practice, man. What are we talking about? Practice? We talking about practice, man. <laughs> Your brain is always trying to optimize things. Therefore, if you don't do something for a while, especially if it's very technical, you will lose that ability. Your body is not thinking like, you know, oh, we're just gonna, we're gonna fuck with them. We're gonna lose the ability to bench press. No, it's just trying to optimize your survival. You can't do everything, and so if you stop doing something, you will slowly lose that ability. And the more skill it requires, the faster you will lose that skill. So if you choose to do anything on tier five, realize that it is a massive time commitment, and it's probably gonna squeeze out other things that you could be doing that are easier and more efficient for hypertrophy. Tier four, it's still quite a bit of time commitment, but it's more doable. You know, I'm not saying like if you do low bar squats or whatever, like you're gonna have to do it every single day, no. But you're probably gonna have to do it every single week, especially if you're doing it for low reps or if you want to optimize that level of performance. And obviously everyone's different. Everyone's tier five and tier four and tier three are gonna be a little bit different. Maybe sprinting comes super naturally to you. You don't have to practice it very much. Not very many people are in that boat. But if you choose a lot of stuff from tier four, realize that you're gonna to have to practice it more often and it could make programming your program very, very challenging. So if you're doing a bunch of really, really complicated stuff, it's gonna to be tough. Tier three, a little bit easier, less upkeep. You can do these you know, once a week or possibly even less and still progress. Tier two and tier one, they require very, very little upkeep, especially tier one. You don't need to practice the skill of preacher curling or leg extensioning. Um, those are basically with you for life and they require no upkeep. Tier two, pretty similar as well. You know, you can do these quite seldomly, very easy to learn, and there's really very little level of mastery involved. You just do them, do them a few times, and then they're mostly just based on how much muscle you have. So I would say choose a variety of tiers. You can choose a couple, maybe one or two or three from tier four in your week, in your program. Um, some from tier three, a bunch from tier two. Tier two is gonna be very, very efficient. Tier one is okay to use as more of an assistance type of work. Often they are less stimulatory, um, and therefore I would say most of your bread and butter should be tier two and tier three, with tier one sort of supplementing and assisting those lifts. And then tier four, whatever that is for you, should be done fairly seldomly. And you might find that some lifts are just not worth doing. You know, Natural Hypertrophy, who actually had a great video on this topic, by the way, definitely check it out, I'll link it up above. He said that if he could go back in time, he would not front squat. Even though he loves a lift, it just takes a long time to learn, and therefore, for hypertrophy, it might not actually be worth it. Once you invest the time and you develop a good understanding of the lift and you have that coordination, the skill and the neuromuscular pathways are all set in stone, okay, now it is worth it. But if you could go back in time, maybe it's not worth starting at the beginning. I have lifts like that. You know, I don't low bar back squat because even though I would absolutely be stronger in that position, I'm more sort of posterior chain dominant, for me it's not worth it because it does have a longer learning curve for whatever reason. I do feel not 100% comfortable with that sort of pinned back position and it's just not really worth it to me. So you don't have to be a power lifter. I'll have a full video on that too. You don't have to do squat, bench, deadlift if you find that it's not worth investing that time in learning those movements. So I think I'll leave it at that. Like the video if you like the video. Subscribe to the channel if you want to see some more dank ass shit. Slap around that notifications button. Really, really get after it. And I will see all y'all in that next video. Peace.